Pictures, what put their head underwater about? for what will be a three hour dive through zero viz, very tight cave, high flow, and expect they're going to be alive at the end of it. It's just forget about it. And I'll come happen. over, I'll do something else, but I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed Craig and said, Craig, let's go, man. We're off to Thailand. And over we went. And um, yeah, the rest is history. Essentially, once I got there, dived the cave, saw the kids, and realized actually these kids will die unless we try something. Then I guess I went, well, maybe something's better than nothing. And I still think this won't work, but let's give it a crack. You like pretend it was your idea, like Rick. I have an idea. I think we should sedate these kids. And no, no, I I denied that idea had anything to do with me for as long as possible, and I still deny it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was a really, it's still a really bad idea. So I, okay. So you, I just want to understand how it went. So you're you're back there with the kids now. Were they put in full face masks? That's ultimately yeah. right. So they're already sedated. And then you start putting the gear on them and they're in the middle, right? There, there's, there was a diver behind them and a diver in front of them. No, no. Okay. So that was so. one of the discussions we had early in the planning phase, you know, do we, should we have two divers, but you know what it's like in zero or low visibility cave that's yeah. very tight, restrictive. The last thing you want is someone else coming up your backside and uh, mm -hmm. trying to harass you while you're trying to, solve the problem of getting through a, a nasty bit of cave. So we decided that actually one diver, one boy is is best. They can take all the time they need then because uh, there are lots of little three-dimensional puzzles in that cave to solve. And you've got this extra bit of baggage to push through and find a, a way through for them as well. And zero, absolute zero viz, I can tell you, it was just black. And um, so, yeah, so we, we went to the end of the cave, myself and four of the Brits. I would anesthetize one boy at a time. We had them in their wetsuits already, put them to sleep. And when I say anesthetize, they were fully surgically anesthetized. You know, you, they, there wasn't sedation. That was full general anesthetic. And wow. um, and then, you know, then you've got this rag doll sitting on my lap and we've got to put the face mask on, which is oh you know, tricky, God. and then strap yeah. a cylinder to their chest. Um, and then one diver would take that boy all the way out and that's a three hour dive. So they had to top up the anesthetic as they went because, uh, wow. you know, the anesthetic was only lasting about three quarters of an hour with this uh, injection in the leg. So I had to teach them all how to be anesthetists as well. I mean, these guys oh, are oh, incredible. God, seriously. Yes. So, Absolutely. so what, what was the plan if, you know, I do some full face mass diving at the George Aquarium. If it flooded, the, the, the full face, I mean, you're in zero vis, it bumps the mask. What did you guys talk about? How would that be dealt with? Well, that was one of my three primary concerns. And look, this wasn't just a theoretical concern. In my cave rescue training, I myself had pretended to be unconscious wearing a full face mask and got people to move me around a cave. And the, the, the mask fills up with water eventually if you don't take some sort of active steps, especially when they start rolling you on your back or exactly. uh, and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I, I honestly gave this zero chance of success. Um, now, in retrospect, I can explain why it worked. You know, we had positive pressure masks, which I hadn't kind of uh, mm. thought about, um, you know, the advantages of them, obviously. We kept the kids face down the whole time. The buoyancy of that full face mask, as you know, is quite, mm -hmm. quite strong. So it lifts their airway up um you know extends their neck keeps their airway in a perfect position i was worried about um hypothermia you know uh the cave was 23 degrees celsius um and so you know it's not cold but cold enough for for a skinny little kid in a baggy wetsuit yeah. for three hours and anesthesia increases heat loss dramatically but ketamine the drug we used actually just counteracts that slightly by constricting the blood vessels in your skin a little bit. So all this stuff, which Incredible. ended up working in the kid's favor, I hadn't actually sort of thought it all through beforehand. So, you know, it was extraordinarily lucky to honestly, but um, some pretty skillful divers as well. Now, what kind of uh, insurance do you have in place that if, for example, you, I mean, because you didn't know, you don't have full on medical backgrounds in these kits that if you injected a kid and they, they had a seizure 10 minutes in or something, and they died. Do you have like some kind of protection because like, the last thing you want is end up in a tight jail because you injected somebody the wrong thing or whatever. Yeah. No, I mean, this was a last ditch life-saving attempt right. to get these boys out. You know, if this didn't work, they were going to die anyway. 
Yeah. No question. So was it like the parents sign off on it, like, or I no, don't know if they should. No. Be. So this is a very different culture. We have to remember it's um you know um, I never spoke to the parents. Right. Um, as far as I'm aware, the Thai government didn't tell the parents exactly what the plan was. They just said there'll be a diving rescue commencing tomorrow. There was no mention of drugs, as far as I know. Good. And um, the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Australian government, actually came up to me on the morning of the first rescue day and did say to me, look, we're actually just a bit concerned if one of these kids dies, you might end up in a Thai prison. Yeah. And I went, great. Great. Thanks for that. Look, I haven't really got time to think about that right now, but I'll just have to trust you guys to get me out of the country if, if that happens. So there was there was wow. some concern, but yeah. um, look, what are you going to do? You just got to get on with it. Well, well, was there ever why why did you all go with the drugging route? I, we haven't really talked about that. Why did you decide to drug them? I mean, would these kids? Com- like when you talked about the potential plan with them, were they freaking out? And you were like, "Uh oh, there's no way these guys are going to do it unless we drug them." I'm wondering what no. what the decision no. was. Yeah, no, I mean it's a very good question. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail in the background to all this to sort of explain the ultimate decision. But in a nutshell, uh, first of all, the kids were they'd been in there for 15 days, I think by the time the first rescue day came. And honestly, I could have said to them, tomorrow I'm coming in, we've got a flying carpet and a bunch of elephants and we're going to fly out and uh, you'll all be fine. And they would have gone, let's get on with it because they just (laughs) wanted to see their mums and dads, right? Yeah. Um, And they knew they were in very, very serious danger. Mm -hmm. Um, When I explained this plan to them through uh, one of the Thai Navy SEALs who spoke English, so he was interpreting, I was watching the kids' faces and they were just like, yep, no worries, let's do it. And honestly, I could not have dragged those kids kicking and screaming to the water's edge and assaulted them with an injection. I, I was not prepared to do that. Right. So I had to get their trust. And I guess that's hopefully one of the skills, you know, as, as a doctor who looks after children, um, sometimes that, you know, you just have to gain people's trust in a, in a short period of time. That's one of the jobs of the anesthesiologist. So, 